Think Forward, Think Research Channel. Well, my focus this afternoon is on Iraq, and in particular on observations that I took from my time there. Uh, as the Dean just shared with you, I returned from Iraq last fall after having served in that country for the bulk of our first two and a half years there. Initially as the commander of the 101st Airborne Division, then doing a, a several week short notice assessment of the Iraqi security forces in spring of 2004, and then over eight, 15 months as the head of the so-called train and equip mission. And I'd like to share with you some observations that I think are the most significant for my participation in the operations in Iraq during my time there. The first lesson that we took uh, from Iraq, a lot of us, was how right T.E. Lawrence, good old Lawrence of Arabia, was when he wrote years ago, uh, back in his own time uh, in that region, about not trying to do too much with your own hands, but helping uh, the others do it with theirs. Uh, he went on to say, oh, by the way, the perfect solution in your mind may actually not be so perfect in their culture after all. And so we did very much subscribe to the idea of helping versus doing. Uh, about helping good local leaders uh, after you identify them and can piece together structures that are multi-ethnic, that are representative of their populations, uh, don't have blood on their hands and so forth. And in fact, in the 101st Airborne Division area in northern Iraq, uh, we worked very, very hard to get an interim government in place very early on, uh, and it did, in fact, enjoy a good degree of success. It was quite representative, um, and it did, in fact, include all the different uh, tribal elements, technocrats, uh, imams, Christian bishop, uh, uh, educators, professors. Uh, in fact, Mosul University is about like this university, not quite as big, actually 35,000 students, uh, and so on. And, uh, and we think it was a very, very important uh, thing to do. I'll talk more about Iraqi leaders at the end because, as you all know, that is the key to success in the way ahead there now. The second one was that, uh, particularly in a location like Iraq, uh, where the expectations were extraordinarily high when we went in. In fact, we used to be constantly confronted with what we call the man in the moon analogy. And they used to say to us, General, you know, you Americans could overthrow Iraq in three weeks. You could put a man on the moon. Why can't you just give us electricity or water uh, or whatever it might be, a basic, uh, a basic need? And the truth was, uh, be frankly, because it was much harder uh, in, in many, many respects, not the least of which is in more, let's say, the last two years just because of insurgent activity uh, attacking certain elements of the infrastructure. But they had enormous expectations. There was a sense that uh, Iraq was the Japan of the Middle East, uh, that all it needed was just to get rid of Saddam and, and it would take off by itself. Uh, in truth, there were 30 years of, of repressive policies, uh, of being ruled by a truly a kleptocrat, which is really what Saddam was, both an autocrat and a kleptomaniac, if you will, stealing from the Iraqi people with his regime and really damaging the society enormously through this enormously repressive uh, means of ruling, which in many respects drove initiative out of the people uh, and affected uh, so many, many different uh, families and citizens in the, in the country. So going in there certainly regarded, uh, certainly in many parts of the country, as an army of liberation, uh, as we did the, uh, the fight to Baghdad, frankly, throughout the South, we were in fact greeted as liberators, and, and in large measure that in the South is still uh, generally the, the, the way that uh, the U.S. and the coalition are regarded. Um, over time, however, we knew very early on that we had a half-life to that army of liberation. And the point of this is to say that this is a race against the clock. A number of us had done some of this before. Uh, we had a number of leaders in the 101st Airborne Division in particular. We had an entire brigade that had done a tour in Kosovo not long before another brigade that had literally just gotten back from Afghanistan. A number of us had served in Central America, uh, in Haiti, in Bosnia, uh, and in that region before. 
and there was a clear recognition that you've got to hit the ground running and you've got to get after it. And it's an enormous lesson, and I think that Michael Gordon's book and some of the others very much underscore the importance of recognizing that the clock is ticking from the moment you hit the ground and you've got to get after it and you've got to get early wins. We certainly tried to do that, particularly in our area. Uh, you can extend the half-life of the Army of Liberation, if you will, by good deeds, by clearly and truly trying to help the people. But in a situation like that, over time, you are going to inconvenience the people. You will injure some of them, uh, in some cases by mistake. You will frustrate them. Uh, and over time, this will gradually build up to the point that they will start to regard you as occupiers. Uh, interestingly, that is not the case yet in Afghanistan. Uh, I came home through there last fall, in fact, uh, at the SecDef's request to look at the train and equip mission over there. Uh, in large measure there because they were so absolutely exhausted by all the fighting that had taken place because they had nothing at all. Uh, the expectations were much lower and therefore that is still jar largely viewed as an army of liberation, uh, the forces that are there from the coalition from NATO and the United States. The key again is you got to go fast. Uh, we learned very, very early on that money is ammunition in what we were doing over there. And, uh, and, and early on we frankly were challenged to get it. Uh, we told Ambassador Bremer, for example, when he made his first, I think his first or second trip out of Baghdad was to Mosul, in fact. We actually walked the streets with him, had a terrific uh, visit with him. And at the end of that, when he asked me, General, what do you need? I said, Ambassador, we need money. I had literally spent all of our operational funds, which were peanuts. I mean, I'm talking tens of thousands of dollars, nothing in, a, in what we were trying to get done for school supplies. Uh, and we were trying to rebuild major elements of the infrastructure uh, to do a lot of work with restoring basic services, buying equipment for security forces and all the rest of that. And I told him, you know, during the fight to Baghdad, with a single radio call, we could launch an a arm, it was called an ATACMS missile, an Army Tactical Missile System missile. It cost about $550,000 each. We launched 113 of these. And now we're trying to get a small amount of money and the bureaucracy is killing us. Can you help us out? To his credit, he did go back to Baghdad and I said, oh, by the way, you know, we captured a billion dollars, which we turned over uh, to folks, and uh, starting to wonder about that now. But, you know, <laughs> um, if nobody's going to use this, how about putting it in the back of a plane and start down in Basra, take off and start throwing it out, stimulating the economy. Please don't run out of all of it until you get up to Mosul. I was partly joking. The truth is he went back and he did, in fact, uh, free up that billion dollars that had been uh, found in walls and all the other places that Saddam and his henchmen had hit it, and, uh, and that did help stimulate, that was the so-called CERP money. In fact, some of the military in here probably were involved in that Commander's Emergency Reconstruction Program. We eventually, in the north, in, in the 101st area, spent about 53.5 million uh, in the first year that we were up there, which is a very, very small amount when you are trying to do what we tried to do. By contrast, over time, the train and equip mission budget is now up over $12 billion. Now, it's by, a lot of that's still being spent. Um, but again, you've got to come at this not only fast, but big, and you've got to get going very, very quickly. Um, these, we actually did a business deal here, by the way. That one's up there. Uh, in fact, a, the good training from the great Woodrow Wilson School taught us a lot about economics, brought a couple of PhDs over from, uh, from Princeton and guys in uniform. And we actually did, in fact, pull off investment deals uh, that Citigroup would have been proud of. There were only about 16 or 17 millions, but that was enough to rebuild that place uh, in that in that location at that time. You could get a lot for your money. The whole idea needed to be not about winning hearts and minds for us, although we certainly wanted to do that, obviously, because it extends the half-life of the Army of Liberation. But what we recognized very early on was most important was giving the people a stake in the success of their new country. And sadly, there are an awful lot of Sunni Arabs that over time came to feel that they did not have a stake in the success of their new country. And of course, one of the issues that Ambassador Khalizad and General Casey are, are, are encouraging the Iraqi government to address is the sense that there are tens of thousands of Sunni Arabs that do not feel that they have, again, uh, that reason uh, to want the new Iraq to succeed. Uh, again, it's been an effort for quite a while. Uh, I, I am convinced Ambassador Bremer did intend to do reconciliation as well as debathification. He allowed us. He personally gave us an exception for a while that helped us enormously. And then uh, that issue was really taken out of his hands, as he wrote in his book, by uh, some senior members of the Iraqi uh, Governing Council who hijacked the, uh, the debathification process. 
big challenge. It still exists. It's something that the Iraqis will have to deal with now very much. The key again, though, is looking at each policy, each program, each initiative, and asking, will this create more Iraqis with a stake in the success of the new Iraq or not? And if the answer to that is no, you need to think real hard before you do it. And we did ask that question of ourselves uh, uh, each time that we, we looked at launching a new program. Uh, and again, we think that, that that did help us at our level uh, to, to try to get the right to navigate these uh, efforts during the times that we were mentoring uh, the new interim government and so forth. There is an operational question that we used to ask as well, and it's the one that's right up here. Uh, because what you want to do is you ideally want to end each day with fewer enemies than you had when you started it. It's a tall order, very difficult, of course, but one way is to constantly test anything you're going to do by asking, will this create more bad guys by the way it's conducted than it takes off the streets? Uh, and again, if the answer to that uh, is that it's going to create more bad guys, you need to look very, very hard at it and you need to figure out how you can do the operation in a way uh, that will be targeted, will not antagonize uh, large neighborhoods or segments of the population when you're going after one or two or three, three key individuals. There are times when I would have been willing to very much risk a no answer to that question. One of those was, in fact, when we killed Uday and Kuse in Mosul. We did offer them an opportunity to surrender. Uh, we did, in fact, go into the house two times with special mission unit members that were augmenting our force for that operation. We had three of them wounded, one of our soldiers, and then we decided that they clearly were not going to come out. There was no way, and that is when we, in fact, uh, engaged the House uh, with very precision anti-tank missiles. Uh, the fact is that that uh, did not cause large da damage in the neighborhood. Had we dropped a bomb, which, in fact, there were some that were at least considering that, uh, or used maybe a tank or something like that, then that, that might have been a different matter. But in this case, we found a way to do that um, but I would have been taken, willing to take a good bit of risk in that particular case. Uh, the key in, in fulfilling that previous imperative of conducting operations in a targeted manner so that you can get individuals uh, precisely and without doing sweeps whenever possible is intelligence. Uh, a counterinsurgency is all about intelligence. It's about precision intelligence. It's about having sufficient actionable intelligence that you can do what we did uh, in one case where we, where we did 35 simultaneous targets uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, in Mosul and got 23 of the ones that we were after uh, with only one shot fired in the entire uh, endeavor. Uh, they all went down simultaneously. We had precision on where we were going. We had a 10-digit grid coordinate. We knew precisely the description of the individual we were after. We had the atmospherics in the neighborhoods. We had routes planned. We had it all drilled to, a de to the detail. And that is hugely important, uh, again, but it all starts with intelligence. We have put a great deal of emphasis on this, as you might imagine, in the preparation of units that have gone back there since, uh, along with a whole host of other uh, training and leader development changes that we've made that I'd be happy to talk about during the question and answer period. Um, early on, we went in there, and, and, uh, and one of the big decisions, frankly, uh, in our area was that we were going to get involved in a major way in the whole civil affairs endeavor. It is not optional. Uh, it would be wonderful if civil affairs battalions alone could do it. Uh, it would be wonderful if all kinds of non-government organizations and other uh, national organizations and others all showed up to do it. Uh, but if that is not the case, you've got to get on with it. And the military has the ability to do that and has enormous capacity uh, and capability. I should have mentioned earlier back in the money slide, in fact, that those two words, capacity and capability, are what this is all about. You have to have those. A handful of people do not represent much capacity, as good as they may be. We had some spectacular individuals that came up to help us, that folk spoke fluent Kurdish and Arabic and everything else. But again, those are armies of one, and they're very small armies. You're, you need large organizations that have their own uh, communications, that have their own security, that can support themselves. And by the time our units were on the ground, the 101st Airborne Division, for example, had 250 helicopters alone. It had about 6,000 or 7,000 vehicles. We had tactical satellite communications that linked all of our units, long-haul comms. 
Uh, we had 28 operational lawyers, and I'll never ever say anything again about lawyers that are in uniform, at least, because they were phenomenal. And they can, you can throw them at problems, like a border op uh, opening that we did, or these investment deals, or a whole host of other activities that we did, and they provide us excellent advice at various times. Um, we had reverse osmosis water purification units, well drillers, four engineer battalions with an engineer group headquarters that exists to do, they're all professional civil engineers who do assessment, design, contracting, QA and QC. What we needed in the beginning was money. It started going uh, and it built over time, but again, a uh, big, big, big lesson there about capacity and capability. Now. Civil affairs are not enough. I love civil affairs unit. I couldn't believe our good fortune when we got up in the north and we found that we were going to have two entire civil affairs battalions attached to us. It's a colossal number of these very limited national assets that our country has. And, uh, but as we surveyed what we needed to do, we recognized that the challenges were staggering. Mosley University is a great example of that. We had a governor in place. Uh, we had a province council, all interim. We sat down with them, we had the security piece going pretty well, had cops back on the street and the rest of that, and sat down with them and said, okay, what's your next priority? And interestingly, they said Mosley University, which was a bit of a, I mean, it showed the commitment, by the way, it shows how much uh, the Iraqi middle class has always treasured education. And Mosul's a fairly educated uh, city, Mosley University is their second most prestigious university, second to Baghdad. And again, it's, a, it's like a University of Michigan uh, size organization, a little bit smaller, but 4,000 staff and faculty, about 100 major capital buildings and so forth. All of that had been looted. They, and they told me that, and so I drove over there after that meeting. We went driving around there with a the chancellor, by the way, about a 67-year-old uh, uh, professor, uh, educated in the UK, PhD from there, and he had about 18 or 19 colleges, each of which has a dean. So you get a sense, this is a big, big endeavor. Again, sadly, all of it had been looted before we got up there on the ground during the period of what was essentially lawlessness uh, in the north because we were not able to bring a unit in from Turkey, as you probably know. Uh, so I went touring around in there, and then from there I went over to see the Civil Affairs Battalion commander, sat down with him, said, okay, big guy, what do you got? You know, we need to rebuild Mosley. He said, ah, oh, sir, we got this great education team Got a young captain, taught elementary school one time, got a couple of sergeants, you know, got a couple of specialists as drivers. I said, man, you know, have you been over there? You see the size of this? This is not, this is not you know, the little rural elementary school. This is a major university. I actually said, I must confess, Michigan State at the time. But, you know, now that I've been to Ann Arbor, I'll never make that mistake again. So anyway, he, he got it, though. And so, you know, I said, okay, let me go back to the command post and get with all the designated thinkers and see what we can come up with. And what we did come up with is we had two aviation brigades. One of those was engaged doing raids back into Anbar province. We had one other that was not that heavily engaged, called up the brigade commander, told him, congratulations, Colonel, you won the lottery, you're going to rebuild Mosley University. It's amazing what happens when you give an organization a mission, give them pretty wide lines on the, ro wide lines on the road, tell him to get after it, tell him to come tell you what he needs in terms of resources, give him about half of what he asks for and tell him to get after it, <laughs> just like the university. Anyway, so, he, he, and I said, by the way, take in that captain and her sergeants and all the rest of that and get them engaged in this as well. It turned out to be a great model. We did that for every single ministry activity throughout northern Iraq and it really paid off. For example, we had a signal battalion. These are big time signal comms now. I mean, these are satellite shots and all the rest of that. And they helped rebuild all the fiber structure and everything else up there, including, by the way, several hundred kilometers of donated fiber optic cable from uh, Bell South that managed to find its way in a logistics aircraft from Fort Campbell, Kentucky. So we got, they partnered with the Ministry of Telecommunications. Our chaplain partnered with the Ministry of Religious Affairs. Um, by the way, we had an imam as a chaplain, an actual U.S. Army imam, and did, did a terrific job for us. Uh, and then we had some others that weren't functioning aligned. We had a core support group. He aligned with the Ministry of Education. That's the elementary and high schools. Uh, we had another that did youth and sports, got 150 soccer teams going and all this kind of stuff. Everybody had a task, and then there were individuals. Everybody had a portfolio. In fact, my portfolio was the governor of Nineveh province, and then the two senior Kurdish leaders, Masoud Bartsani, the leader of the Kurdish Democratic Party, KDP, and Jalal Talabani, who's now the president of Iraq, actually, who is the leader of the PUK. 
um, and, and got after it. And, uh, and, and again, when you're trying to do industrial strength rebuilding, you've got to give mission type orders. You've got to say, here's what I want you to do. Get out there, get after it, get going. Let me know what you're doing if you have a chance. Uh, oh, by the way, if you don't have a chance, don't worry. Keep going and I'll come out and see what you're doing. And if you're outside the white lines, I'll tell you. By the way, we had two or three of our nine infantry battalion commanders. We had about 40 or 45 battalion commanders total. But those, the infantry were key because they controlled ground. And there's probably two of those that really weren't that enamored of nation building. And the word came back to me, and I sort of checked this out. And I mean, there's one guy that all he was doing was going on every single raid his unit did every night, because that's what manly men do. And uh, his battle rhythm was phenomenal. He got up about 10 in the morning. He lifted weights for an hour. You know, we brought our weights with us. This is the 101st Airborne. So, and we had pull-up bars. But anyway, so he's getting after it. And, uh, and he'd get the update for that night's operation, go through the rehearsal, and then he'd go out the gate with the unit. You know, really admirable stuff, sharing risk at the point of decision and all the rest of that. The problem was I needed him doing nation building. So we put the word out couple days, I said, I'm going to come down there, brigade commander and assistant division commander, get the word to this guy that I want to go down there and confirm his excellence in the plan on nation building three days from now. Of course, they went the day before and the day before that. And by the time we got down there, by God, you know, he was exhausted. I said, what have you been doing? Oh, sir, I've been delivering air conditioners to EMOMs all day. So anyway, that's what you got to do. And the 3ID guy knows that too. Okay. You got to build not just battalions, brigades, divisions. And we learned this big time, you got to build institutions. And in fact, the institutional mission was given to the organization that I commanded when I was last there about a month or so before I left. Um, in fact, now the challenge in Iraq in the future, I think, is going to be ministries. It is the ministries of finance through which all this enormous oil wealth has to flow to get to other ministries to get out to do any good for the Iraqi people. It's an enormous challenge. They were incredibly hidebound bureaucrats in the past. Uh, these are very tiny pinholes through which decisions and money have to pass still. And it's something that needs a great deal of attention. And I want to assure you when I went back uh, and did some calls in Washington after coming home last fall that I made that, that very, very clear to the folks uh, with whom I met at that time. It's a lot easier to build infantry battalions than it is to build logistical structures, to build ministries, military academies, staff colleges, branch schools, training bases and all the rest of that. You've got to do it all, and you've got to try to do it simultaneously if, we, if you can. Very big truism. Anybody that's any student at all of counterinsurgency operations knows that you can lose it militarily, but it's, you're not going to win it militarily. You're going to win it politically. And, and over time, that is what has to be done. Uh, over time in Iraq, there will be a political solution. There has to be. There has to be a government of national unity. It has to reach out to, to those Sunni Arabs who are rational and would be willing to be part of the solution instead of the pro part of the problem, thereby stripping them off from the true, no kidding, uh, foreign extremists and, and national extremists, the Saddamists who will never come in from the cold, and the violent criminals, many of whom were let out of jail by Saddam in the fall of 02. These are critical elements to all of it, but if you do an equation that says, you know, drawdown of US forces equals, there are, there are an awful lot of factors in there, and probably the biggest coefficient goes in front of the factor that has to do with political environment. Because in the 12 or so of 18 provinces where things are going fine, the reason is because the people are, act, are okay with the political situation in those areas. It's obviously the nine southern provinces, it's the three Iraqi Kurdish provinces, and then it's actually really two parts of two of the other, the remaining six. But in that Sunni Arab Air, do, dominated area and Baghdad, which of course is very mixed, um, there in those cases you don't have that. It's why you have the sectarian strife and again it has to be addressed by Iraqi political leaders. Uh, you know, we've learned over and over how important it is to understand the culture in which you're operating. I mentioned to the dean earlier today that believe it or not one of the big things that a civilian graduate school does for an army officer uh, is teach them that there are some really bright folks out there in the world that don't have the same basic uh, assumptions about life in general, uh, core values perhaps, and all the rest of that. And that's a pretty good uh, preparation for going into a foreign culture, frankly, uh, because again, very bright people there have different approaches to life. Uh, believe it or not, you know, if you live a bit of a cloistered existence with your known to the grindstone all the time, uh, the way we occasionally do in the military, 
Uh, this is an extraordinary experience. And it, by the way, I'm happy to report our Army is going to send several hundred additional officers, young officers, to graduate school each year. And the Ford School's got its hand up, and they'll get their share, I'm sure. Uh, again, this is what you have to understand. And interestingly, these are members of the province council up there in Nineveh province. Uh, and I can still look at each of these and, and, and remember the background of the individual, uh, if he was from a political party, uh, what, what his views would be on many of the different issues and all the rest of that. And we had to do an awful lot of this right there. That's a brigade commander sitting in, with, a, with the deputy governor of that particular province. Uh, it all comes down at some point to local leaders. Uh, about a year ago, a lot of us started saying, hey, the good news is uh, this is approaching the point where Iraqi leaders can take this forward. The challenging news is this is approaching the point where Iraqi leaders have to take it forward. And it's leaders that it'll start at the national level with individual like these right here, again, forming that government of national unity. Uh, it will include developing capacity and capability in the ministries so that the resources of the of Iraq, which are phenomenal. Iraq is not just sitting on the second largest oil resources in the world. Uh, it has something no other country in the region has, and that is water. It's the land of the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. That also means it has incredible agriculture. It has a phenomenal irrigation system still, even though it was totally really uh, ignored by Saddam in the final 10 years and required a lot of repair. But again, these ministries are the key to providing for the basic needs of the Iraqi people, uh, and they have to be supported by the national leaders. At the province level, they can't do winner-take-all politics, which is really what Iraq has been about an awful lot of its existence, and that's going to be a challenge. And then, of course, in the security forces, they have to have leaders that have, again, sort of the values that, that I think most military leaders in the world uh, would subscribe to, where you look to your soldiers' needs first and then to yours. Uh, you share their risk, you share their hardship, uh, and, you, and you deal with them equitably on the basis of their ability as soldiers, not because of their sectarian uh, background, tribal uh, affiliation, or political party. We have a huge responsibility to these young individuals called here the strategic corporals or the strategic lieutenants. They are people who are out on the perimeter of a hasty uh, perimeter of a raid. They're the people who have put in a traffic control point on short notice. Uh, they are people who are therefore making, in the blink of an eye, life or death decisions about whether the car approaching them at a high rate of speed is a suicide car bomber or just somebody who didn't read the sign and blew right past the light that was flashing. It's enormously important so that we can minimize having to stop vehicles like that. And of course, in some cases, not only are these life or death situations, there are situations that have strategic consequences if you get them wrong. We owe an obligation, again, as I said, we have an obligation to these individuals. We must continue to, to improve the training uh, that they get for the situations that they face in places like Iraq. And we've got to help them shape the situation with better, simple technology. I mean, just how do you stop a car so you don't have to put bullets in the window? If it, how do you make sure that the sign is really visible at night in a, in a country where people are on edge to begin with and nervous about whether it's a militia uh, checkpoint or it's a legitimate coalition or security force checkpoint? Very, very challenging prob problem. And in truth, you cannot imagine how difficult the security environment is for soldiers who are working in a country where any person who approaches them could be a suicide vest wearer or uh, could be driving a, a car with a bomb on it. And that leads to this. You've got to have leaders who are flexible and adaptable. Leaders who can perform tasks for which they may or may not have been trained. Some tasks that they never even envisioned uh, when they, when they uh, entered the service, when they went through their branch schools and their professional military education. Frankly, we have completely revamped our training all throughout our education system. Uh, uh, at the combat training centers, what used to be the clash of the tank titans, the big tank battles in the Mojave Desert at the National Training Center, which we oversee, has now become a continuous insurgency where our soldiers, at the op opposing force soldiers, even al are allowed to grow beards. They act like insurgents, and we even bring in 300 or so Iraqi role players who are honest-to-God Iraqis. They just now live in San Diego or Los Angeles. 
and they take great delight in playing these roles. We got about 2,200 different roles that we pick from uh, for them to, to, uh, to act out, and they do a great job. In fact, we were just out there recently using our survival Arabic with them, and it was a lot of fun. In fact, we found Kurds who were playing Shia, and, and it's the only place in the world where all the Kurds get together and all the Iraqis get together. I don't know what we do here in our country. The last lesson is, is the most important when we're talking to uh, U.S. military leaders, and we got a lot of future ones here. And that is that the number one job for the leader of a military organization in a challenging situation like this is to set the right tone. Now, the truth is that the dean would tell you that the most important job of a leader in any organization, and Citigroup would say the same, is to set the right tone for that organization. In a situation like Iraq, it very much begins with the right ethical tone. It includes clear instructions on treatment of detainees. It includes swift action if people cross those, get outside the white lines that have been put down for them and dealing with the local population, again, with detainees and in a host of other cases. Uh, it includes very much finding that right mix of the kinetic, of the lethal activities, the, the, mili the traditional military actions and the non-kinetic, the, the non-lethal activities, the nation-building aspects, in a sense, the softer side of things. And by the way, it changes constantly, because in a situation like this, what works in Mosul today won't work in Mosul tomorrow, it won't work in Tikrit today, uh, and so on. And you have to, again, be flexible and adaptable enough to recognize that, and the guy at the top has to continually ensure that the right tone has been transmitted to his subordinate leaders and then echoed and re-echoed through the ranks all the way down to the bottom. It's a very, very big challenge and a very big responsibility. There is even one there in terms of dealing with the local population that we put in, because it, it, on occasion, I think we've overlearned cultural awareness to the point that we were always just endlessly polite, patient, hospitable, and so forth in dealing. But gosh, you know, they're getting emotional with us. On occasion, we actually have to show, in fact, the full range of emotions as well. Uh, and it's important to do that. Ideally, you have control of them as you're doing it, and it's not for real, but there's a little bit of acting that goes on out there as well. Is it realistic that American force levels can be reduced in light of the problems facing Iraqi security forces, including sectarian loyalties, infiltration by insurgents and corruption. Yeah, I, th I think it is, very much, actually. Um, there, is, there have been no end to challenges in helping to build Iraqi security forces. Um, but, and you can you know, take 20% off all the statistics, I can tell you that it has been a steady climb in terms of capabilities of those forces. Where in the summer of 2004, when, when uh, the initial Iraqi government assumed the sovereignty of their country, uh, there were virtually no Iraqi battalions, infantry battalions, fighting uh, with our forces at all. Uh, there are now some, uh, is it six, 55, I think it is, 55 police and army battalions that are at or what are called in the lead and another uh, 70 or thereabouts that are in what's called the category of fighting alongside. We ought to pull that up. We actually have a slide, so I make sure we don't misquote. Uh, but it's roughly around, there's in the, in the neighborhood of 130, 140 battalions are actually in the fight. They are, there are uneven, there's unevenness in some of the quality of the ones naturally that are more uh, inexperienced than others, but those that we started building all the way back in 2004 the 1st Division, the 6th Division, the 2nd Division, others, they are actually doing quite well. And it does give you very much hope, I think, that if there can be a government of national unity, which again is the key ingredient uh, to the way ahead, that they can very much uh, allow us to uh, draw down our forces. Uh, and this is an unclassified characterization, because there's a classified, but it's, we're always lower with the unclassified. Again, has continued a pretty substantial uh, level of progress. This is the very latest one, I think, that literally just came out a week ago. So it's about, a, about half and half. Out of the 140 now, they're actually so-called in the fight. Uh, you can see about 70 are in the lead. Now, in the lead 
means that they still do need some assistance from our forces. Uh, and that could be as little as some logistical support. Uh, it could be, it certainly is medical evacuation in some cases, uh, big fire support or something like that. But they're mu very, very much in the fight uh, and increasingly in the lead. There's another statistic, if we can pull it up, that's a very, very important number there. And that's a metric that is hugely significant. Because again, until probably, certainly early 2005, there were no Iraqi battalions that owned their own battle space, as it's called. In other words, controlled their own area of responsibility. Uh, there are now 55 of those. And you can see a sizable number actually in Baghdad. I mean, that's 27 battalions. Each of these battalions averages somewhere around 800 uh, uh, men. They're a little bit smaller on the police side. They're larger on the Army side. But if you figure roughly seven, 800, typically have about a, a fifth of those will be on leave at a time because they have to take their pay home uh, every month and a half or so and has been a big challenge in itself. But you can see that a lot, quite, quite a few there. Interestingly, nine battalions in Anbar province, which includes Fallujah, most of those actually in Fallujah, where we put the first division that was formed and is really a very, very good division. The challenge is pushing out to Ramadi and then out the Euphrates River Valley, which has been the focus of a lot of operations. And there are actually two full Iraqi divisions in Anbar province now uh, that, are, that are very much operational, where again, back in, say, November 04, during the operation of Fallujah, there was virtually nothing. What is your opinion about the recent elections and the status of women? Is this a, is this a concern for the future of the country? Well, as, as I recall, there is a mandate in the Constitution that women have to be a certain number in the National Assembly, which I can assure you is a vastly higher number than they ever had before. Um, interestingly, when we did the interim election in Nineveh province, in the beginning, we could not persuade them to get to, to allow women to uh, be on the province council. We did eventually. By, the, by about October, November of that year, uh, we actually were successful in getting them to add four women to the province council. Uh, women have always played a very big role in Iraqi life. They have actually traditionally been very, very active in the medical field, the legal field, uh, education field. Um, not necessarily, though, in, in the military, certainly, uh, or in the, perhaps the inner circle, with a couple of exceptions. There was one very prominent female that you may recall. Uh, but there is much, much greater participation in the National Assembly than there ever has been, and it's by constitution. So I think that that's, uh, that's actually a pretty big step forward uh, for women in Iraq. That's not to say, again, there's not challenges and that in some cases the resurgence of more fundamentalist forms of Islam uh, is not running counter to that because I think that's the, the concern that people have. Okay. In the military, how do you teach adaptability? Um, we, it's, it's a great question. Um, there are a couple of ways that we think that you produce, we have this wonderful buzzword now, you know, the military is very much into jargon, and of course we now have the Army Pentathlete Leader. The Pentathlete Leader, I guess, is somebody who's versatile, and again, has this quality of adaptability and the quality of flexibility that I talked about that's very important uh, in this endeavor. Some of it actually comes from American culture. Some of it comes from the way we try to train people and, and in a sense, challenge them in a lot of the uh, basic military courses they get with literally everything from leader reaction courses to uh, what do you do now, ranger exercises, uh, what do you do now, lieutenant, all these types of scenarios, uh, field exercises, and so forth. In our field exercises, unlike virtually any other countries until we started doing it, there is a free playing, thinking, opposing force that can beat you. And in fact, routinely beat us at the National Training Center and the Joint Readiness Training Center, kicked our butt. Uh, and so that is a, a, another part. What I was mentioning earlier to, the, to some of the students upstairs was that we think it is very important, actually, that there are two additional factors in this, one of which is an out of the intellectual uh, comfort zone experience. And civilian graduate school is that uh, for our military officers. And I don't mean that in any kind of humorous way, but I mean, it's just you open up your eyes. Uh, I mentioned that I actually went from the Command and General Staff College, you know, we'd had a year of military academia, uh, to uh, the good old Woodrow Wilson School there at Princeton, uh, and it was a pretty eye-opening experience for me, and I hadn't had a sheltered existence uh, up to that point. So very, very good experience again. 
And then the other one is probably that we, we get folks in jobs where they can watch very senior folks make really tough decisions. I can tell you that it is a real experience to, uh, and I've been very fortunate to have been the aide to an Army Chief of Staff, the exec to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Special Assistant to Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, and when the door closes and everybody else is out of the room to hear what they say is a pretty big education, particularly if you're wrestling with issues. The chairman on my watch uh, did the air campaign in Kosovo, did Bosnia, did uh, uh, Desert Fox and a couple of these others, and uh, it's pretty great education to see them grappling with all of the challenges and the various forces that are all trying to work them. Uh, and so that's, that's how we think that we're going about this. Uh, there's other pieces uh, I could talk about, the great increase in cultural awareness training, again, trying to get people to understand how other people think, and specific language training and a variety of these others as well. Uh, General, to what extent do Al Jazeera and other so-called hostile media impact U.S. success? Uh, they have a pretty big impact, actually, and it's not a good one uh, in many cases. On the other hand, um, before you criticize Al Jazeera, be willing to go on it. And, it. and it was frustrating to me on occasion that some folks would hammer Al Jazeera and badmouth it and everything else, and then you'd say, well, you know, they were looking for somebody to go on. Why don't you go on camera? Um, I actually did it four times uh, when I was in Iraq in different assignments. Uh, they always asked snide questions. They, also, they always had snide follow-ups, but they always translated what I said 100% accurately. Uh, and as you know, you don't have to answer the question they gave. You can give the answer you want. Uh, <laughs> you know that old joke about the speaker, you know, the person asked the question, the speaker gave the answer, and the person stood up and did the follow-up and said, well, you didn't ask my, answer my question. And the speaker says, well, you didn't ask mine. So, I mean, you can... <laughs> um, so I think very much, actually, that that is... Uh, that's, that's, we have to do... We have to engage. We actually, by the way, another thing we actually have at Fort Leavenworth we are the proponent for what's called the information operations uh, functional area in our Army. And so all the off we're actually a huge effort now to train people to work the information operations field. Uh, and this is not psyops or black stuff or, you know, illegal. This is just engaging pr appropriately and figuring out that if you're going to do a raid in this village tomorrow morning, send somebody along that then engages the people afterwards um, yeah, follows up with it, explains to him why you did what you did, that goes on press ahead of time, or, or not ahead, but right away after it, and explains again why you did what you did and so forth. General, there seems to be much debate about adequate troop size. Colin Powell advocated having a massive force, and this was very successful yeah. in the first Gulf War. Now Army scholars are taking lessons from Vietnam regarding the best size for fighting insurgents. What is your opinion on this issue? Uh, my opinion is that it's an extraordinarily tough call, actually, because we have the situation, particularly now, frankly. I'm not going to go back and revisit history. You can read Michael Gordon's book as well as I can, and I think there's some pretty clear uh, uh, items out of that. I, I was able to say when I was the commander of the 101st that we felt that we had enough forces for what we were asked to do, and I think the results uh, did actually speak for themselves in that area. By the way, when I did go back as the commander of the Multinational Security Transition Command Iraq, or Min Sticky for short, um, the first thing I did was ask for several hundred additional very high-ranking officers uh, and non-commissioned officers and a whole bunch of trainers and others, uh, and $1.8 billion, and I got it. Uh, now, um, so there, in General Casey, every time he's asked for more troops, which I think is at least three times, uh, for the two of the elections in, in a small, uh, modest increase right now during the uh, Shia uh, Shura celebration, um, that he has gotten them all the time as well. The problem is that we are very, very concerned at this point that we will create a dependency culture uh, because the longer we stay in some respects is the longer they, they avoid taking stuff on. And, and this is a culture, again, in which everything was done for them. All decisions were made for them in the past in a lot of ways. I mean, I'm overstating this, but I mean, food was provided, there's a ration system, there's a ration card, there's the this, you know, oil is at, gasoline's at one point something cents a gallon. So again, there was a very much uh, dependency culture that existed as it was on Saddam, which he wanted to create. And we don't want to perpetuate that, obviously. We want, it, so it's a real test of, you know, 
when do you throw them in the deep end and how long do you let them bob up and down before you go get them again if you have to or before they actually come to the top. And it's a real, real, real tough call. Uh, there is now also, clearly, I mean, there's just how quickly can you recycle units from the U.S. Army? How long can you uh, keep asking soldiers, you know, at a very high rate uh, to, to, to go back? Uh, the first unit is just back in Iraq for a full second year tour. With all due respect to the 3rd Infantry Division, uh, many of them got out of there well before a year. Uh, the first time, about six months, probably on average for most. There were some, to be fair, that did stay a long, long time because they sat there in Kuwait for a while. But the 101st Airborne Division is actually the first unit back there now for a second full year tour. They seem to be hanging tough. I think their, their reenlistment rates are fine, but we have to keep that in mind. Uh, the Army actually has increased. You know, it's got about 30,000 extra soldiers over what its authorization was. Um, but at, but at, the, at the end, they want to get it, get it on back down. You mentioned that every liberation movement has a half-life, and at some point, the liberators presumably become occupiers. When that happens, what's a well-meaning liberator to do? <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't think you ever stop trying to be a liberator. Uh, and the truth is, it's never, it's not a light switch, and there's still enormous amount of gratitude to you for what you've done. But there's also, they will say, look, General, okay, we, you know what? Let us, let us do this one. And of course, you say, I'm happy to have you do it. Now, the, the challenge is that not in all cases is there the capacity and the capability to do it. And then again, you have to, uh, to, to remain engaged. But I, I think you have to continue, certainly, very sincerely and truly, to keep trying to help and keep, keep trying to do all that you can. I mean, you can actually regain uh, uh, sometimes trust that, that may have been lost and so forth as well just by being honest. I mean, all of our units made mistakes. The question is, what do you do when you find that out? And the answer is, you make it right as quickly as you can, and you explain it to people, and you make amends for it. I mean, Iraq actually has a huge history of this, and they have something called salatia pay. Um, and if somebody is, is, is hurt or killed, uh, and, and if it's a mistake, uh, and that stuff happens in the kind of uh, environment that you're, doing, you're in over there, you go make a salatia payment personally, apologize personally, and actually that, you know, frankly, in, in that culture, you know, all is generally forgiven. So now, if you stonewall it, if you deny it, if you don't admit it, if you don't, then, then you've got a problem on your hands. This is our last one. Okay. Do you believe that the U.S. press is presenting an accurate picture of what is being done in Iraq? Uh, let me start off by giving a, a little vignette. When I we were actually sitting in Kuwait waiting to go through the berm in uh, mid-March of uh, 2003, and, you know, we're, we're starting to feel, as you would imagine, you know, this war is imminent and all the rest of this. And uh, anyway, we're getting briefed one night. Public affairs officer stands up and proudly says, sir, here's a new slide. You know, we have, again, all kinds of slides in the military. So here's a new slide. I'm going to start tonight grading the press on whether the stories are positive or negative. I said, okay, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm just trying to get through this darn briefing. So we went on actually three slides later. Oh, stop, stop. Go back three slides. I said, I, I just don't think that's the right metric. You need to grade the press on whether it's accurate or inaccurate. That's all we can ask. Uh, but by God, if it's inaccurate, we ought to let them know that we are displeased with the fact that it is inaccurate. But if we crash a bunch of helicopters, if we lose a bunch of soldiers, that is clearly a negative story. But if it's reported accurately, that's all we can ask. Uh, we're not going to try to spin this thing uh, you know, like a top or something like that because it won't work. Uh, and again, there was to some degree an advantage of you know watching real senior guys at real senior levels uh, and learning you know don't ever lie to the press because it doesn't work. So we that was what we tried to employ, and I think it actually stood us in pretty good stead. And I think again, I think the 101st was uh, certainly one of the more open units to the press. Um, I, having said that, on several occasions I went back to uh, very senior people, including uh, in one case the son of the former owner of a very, very important newspaper in America in Washington and met with him and, uh, and did discuss an article that I thought had completely missed the mark. Uh, and I mean, this is with a real senior guy now, um, you know, the owner. Uh, and, um, and he took it extraordinarily well. They want to know when they have not done that. And you know who the editors are, you work with them. Uh, we went to a number uh, at various times. The Wall Street Journal one time had a very damaging story. It was just flat wrong. And so we brought the writer in, called the editor, spent all night calling people. 
to, to, to uh, correct it. Uh, but by and large, having said that, by and large, I truly believe that, that most of the, you know, the mainstream press, there's clearly press that is, you know, without question uh, not, but the mainstream press, the New York Times, the Washington Post, um, and the others are trying to report accurately. Um, and the challenge, though, now increasingly is that because it's so very difficult for the press to get out of very, very cocoon-like existences, that they are increasingly having to depend on others. In some cases, they're increasingly depending on Iraqi stringers. And Iraqi stringers know to some degree what sadly sells. I, you know, and, 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 it's, and so there have been cases where uh, we know stories that took place because we were there were really, really dramatized beyond all recognition by people who were actually there, not US journalists, but then are providing the facts to the, as they saw them to the journalists. And that is a very big challenge that the journalists are having to, having to deal with now. But to be fair, I don't know how to do it better because the, uh, the, the difficulty of getting out and getting a story uh, is enormous in an environment where you can be kidnapped, where you can be uh, taken hostage and so forth. 99% uh, of the time, they could probably drive around just fine in Baghdad, but that other 1% is horrific. And, uh, and, and as those other 1% accumulate, uh, as you would imagine, the, the various organizations have really restricted uh, their members of the press. I think the military does have to be more open at times. I mean, it very much depends on unit commanders and their comfort level with letting press come in. Uh, you know, sometimes we feel like the press has got to give us a break, and if, you know, one soldier whines, that doesn't become the, the, the story of the day or something like that. And I think in general, with most of them, uh, that, that you can have that kind of relationship where they will characterize things properly and they'll report accurately. Uh, there have, to be sure, been missteps by some of our troopers and units in Iraq and Afghanistan, and some of them have been very serious. But for each soldier who failed to live up to our country's expectations, there have been thousands of others who have selflessly gone about their mission, doing what they've been asked to do, enduring separation from loved ones, soldiering in crushing heat and sandstorms, battling a truly barbaric enemy, grappling with the complexities and frustrations of working in cultures that are very different from our own, and in some cases, shedding blood or giving the last full measure of devotion in carrying out their assigned missions. I'd like to briefly talk about one of the many great soldiers with whom I was privileged to serve in the 101st Airborne Division, Master Sergeant Luis Rodriguez, a great leader who loved being an Army medic and reveled in being doc to the infantrymen he supported. A highly competent, extremely professional NCO, he always led from the front and gave energy to all around him in the most difficult of times while serving as a medical platoon sergeant for one of our air assault infantry battalions. After nine months of great work in Iraq, however, tragedy struck. On November 24, 2003, Master Sergeant Rodriguez's convoy was ambushed, and he bore the brunt of the attack. Hammered by shrapnel, he lost the tips of two fingers on his left hand and had his right leg severed just above the knee. Now the medical leader, who had repeatedly been the one to serve others, needed help from his comrades, and they got him to a field hospital very quickly. I flew to the hospital as soon as we heard about the attack and saw Master Sergeant Rodriguez shortly after he came out of the operating room. After pinning a Purple Heart on him, telling him how proud we were of him, and assuring him that he'd be in our prayers, I tried to make a little small talk to update him on the condition of the other members of his platoon and to see how he was bearing up. What happened next will remain with me forever. Master Sergeant Rodriguez looked up at me, thanked me for my concern about him and his troopers, and asked me, how I was doing. I've been worried about you, he said. The division's had a tough month, and I know it's had to be tough on you. I was stunned. Here's a man who's just lost a leg, and he's asking me how I was doing. But that concern for fellow soldiers is what typified, and still typifies, Master Sergeant Rodriguez and countless other soldiers with whom we served in the brotherhood of the close fight. Master Sergeant Rodriguez was evacuated to Germany and then to the United States, and he spent the next four months in an amputee ward at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, undergoing 16 surgeries and learning how to walk again with a new prosthetic leg with crutches. I visited him there as well and was surprised when he said that he wanted to stay in the Army 
and help train combat medics. Though we all supported that request, I wasn't sure whether it could work, though we pledged to do all that we could to help the Army get to yes. After a final operation, he was released to return home to his wife and their two daughters in Clarksville, Tennessee. But problems awaited him there as their home was small, had narrow halls, and didn't easily accommodate Master Sergeant Rodriguez's crutches and new needs. In fact, he could barely manage to get himself and his apparatus into the bathroom. Then his prayers were answered. He received a new high-tech prosthesis, and more importantly, he and his family were selected by ABC's Extreme Makeover Home Edition <laughs> to receive a completely remodeled home. And this slide shows him, and, and he's here overcome by emotion, and that's the before and the after of his house. This was really one of those occasions when one feels that there truly is good in the world. Meanwhile, he continued his fight to stay in the Army to do the job he loves, training combat medics. And thanks to some great senior leaders in our Army demonstrating that same flexibility and adaptability I've talked about in my remarks, he was allowed to stay in uniform and was selected to be the non-commissioned officer in charge of the combat medical training facility at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Meanwhile, Master Sergeant Rodriguez's wife proved to be a hero in her own right. Not only did she provide enormous strength during her husband's ordeal, she started studying to be a social worker in order to become a counselor to families of soldiers who were killed or injured. This brave couple clearly took tragedy and turned it into triumph, and they are sterling examples of the wonderful, selfless individuals who serve our country on a daily basis. I strongly believe, in fact, that all Americans should be very grateful for what their young soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines have done and are doing in Iraq and Afghanistan and a host of other places around the world. Tom Brokaw, who you'll recall wrote The Greatest Generation, spent some time with the 101st when we were deployed in northern Iraq. Before getting on a helicopter after a particularly good day seeing the myriad tasks in which our troopers were engaged, he turned to me and said, surely these soldiers are the new greatest generation. I agreed with that then, and I still do. Repeatedly in Iraq, I saw the concept of the Army of One slogan played out as soldier after soldier proved to be the decisive individual in the performance of a particular task at a particular place on the battlefield. In fact, I often wondered, especially while observing soldiers rendering a final salute to a fallen comrade after a memorial ceremony, where does our country find such individuals, young men and women who, despite the personal flaws that we all have, serve so selflessly in the face of enormous challenges, repeatedly demonstrate impressive initiative, determination, innovativeness, and courage. I raise this today because of the, as the discussion over Iraq continues, it's my hope that our country will never turn its back on those in uniform who have done what their country asked them to do, even though that duty required enormous sacrifice and entailed substantial hardship by them and by their families. And so this evening at this great university, at an event hosted by a school that celebrates public service, I want to express my hope that our country will never forget and never fail to honor the sacrifices of those who wear and have worn our country's uniform. Thank you very much. Major funding for this program was provided by Citigroup Foundation. Additional funding was provided by the University of Michigan Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. 